We've done quite a few things today, a few different experiences. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit of feedback from uh, mindfulness of eating. Was there anything you noticed, anything you'd like to share about uh, mindfulness of walking on the stairs? or mindfulness of going to the bathroom, you don't have to give details, uh, or going, um, taking your food, or anything that, that you felt was uh, interesting, useful, new, something that might be inspiring to others. Is there anything that you'd like to share? Today we get instructions of the mindfulness of eating, taking mm. a bite, with the eyes closed, trying to feel for a piece of food, taking a bite, and uh, then let go of the hands, put it down. <laughs> There's a whole new different feeling. Just when we are chewing, this time it's uh, I'm observing what I chew and the taste, because the eyes are closed, the sense all basically uh, with no, everybody quiet, no sound. The senses was all on the taste buds. So, for once I can say, oh, there's more fiber, there is a sour, sourish, and the textures are different. On top of that, um, with the instructions of the weather, the tongue is controlling the food, or the mind controlling the tongue. That was, uh, it never crossed my mind over too many decades of life. Mm. So I was trying to, and I realized that I tried to control the tongue, but the tongue don't listen to me. <laughs> It's interesting, isn't it? When I tried to control the tongue and tell the tongue not to move, I can't chew. Right. So, so that was something new that all this while is just like put in the mouth, chew, 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 swallow. But somehow this is the first time we realize what the tongue is doing, what's the function of the tongue in our mouth, help, it, help us to bring the food down the throat and do the digestion. So it's something new to me in the sense of eating is different. Yeah. Different sensation, different feeling. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you very much for sharing. Um, I'm not sure if this is related or not, but you asked to close eyes and then try to grab the culprit, right? Mm. So I was trying to do that. I was so sure that I'm holding a spoon because I'm feeling it. And turns out it's a fork when I open my eyes. So but at that time I was super focused, like, you know, trying to get the food. But it's a bit hard, so I need to open my eyes. Yep. It turns out it's not as good as before. Mm. So yeah, there's some interesting experience. Actually, life can be very much like that. You think something is the way it is, and then you realize it's completely not that way. So, yeah, sometimes it's good to just check anyway, but other times just run with what you've got and just run with the experience that you're having. Even, yeah, it, it ultimately it doesn't matter. You'll get something in your mouth eventually. Yeah. Nice. Thanks for sharing. Anybody else? Yeah? I, I was actually introduced to this uh, six aspects during the retreat. So yeah. You, you, you're totally, mm, experience things that you never experienced before yes. uh, to our eating meditation. Um, so eventually you, you, you started I started to enjoy the process of eating. Right? And you, you treasure that moment. Um, is that part of craving actually? No, no, it's similar to what our friend here said earlier, that it's it's perfectly fine to especially in the sense of meditation, to enjoy meditation, to enjoy mindfulness. I think this is this is a great thing. It, it it inspires us to do it more and more. So, um, but did you mean um, the desire for the food or the desire for the the experience? No, there's nothing wrong with a desire to have a new experience, but you remind yourself, I don't know what's going to happen. So then the mind is open. You're not. You're not craving for a specific experience, but perhaps open-minded to a new experience. Actually, I live my life like that. Actually, it's not that I have a desire for a new experience. It, it's more, 
that I know that I cannot live any other way because I can never have the same experience twice in anything in life. I can't even have the same breath twice. I can't blink my eyes the same twice. So I know that every experience is going to be a new experience. So in that way, you, you relax that and you just you live in that flow of new experiences, which is, for me, it's very bright and fresh and, and exciting and interesting. So it's okay to, to have that desire, especially even the desire to meditate is perfectly fine. Yeah. Desire for new experience is fine. Yeah. <coughs> but the, at times, right, that desire, but when the condition is not right, you keep craving for that environment. Ah, uh, abortion. Oh, you mean, are uh, you um, craving for the for the environment, the like the meditative envir environment, like the retreat? You went on the retreat, yeah. and after the retreat, you weren't satisfied with with being at home and being at work because it's so busy and noisy and stuff, and you wanted to be back at retreat again. Y yes, sort of, because you, you, you experience that experience of eating. Mm. Hence, in order to uh, sort of like replay those experiences, the right environment, the right conditions mm. need to facilitate that process. Mm. However, when you come back to reality at times, it doesn't, it doesn't resonate with that kind of environment. Right. Well, this is just expectation. And we're expecting, we've had a nice experience, it's like I was saying earlier, you've had a nice experience and then you're kind of expecting to get a new experience or to have another experience. And we need to, that's why I gave you the mantra this morning or the reminder, I don't know what will happen, anything can happen, let me just observe, watch and feel and learn from whatever happens. So we have to keep coming back to that again and again coming back to the present moment and just saying, I'm here now, this is my experience, whatever's going to come, will come. And this, although this is hard, because our mind is very often jumping to the future, it's, all, it's very often saying, what's next? What can I get next? What's going to happen? And so the mind is skipping and jumping to the future. But you can come back to, you just remind yourself, come back to the present. What I'm experiencing now, this is enough. Let me be here and now. So that is to ground ourselves. Yep. <clears throat> Definitely grounding yourself. Yep. Anchoring the mind in the present. And if you don't like what's happening in the present, notice that dislike. Notice the aversion. Notice the, the resistance to what is happening in the present. And even start to understand, even it's not analyzing, but when you feel that resistance and feel it without thinking, so it's not analyzing and you feel that resistance and you really get that sense of dukkha that you really don't like what is happening now, then sometimes we can start to see where is this coming from? We can start to see some deeper levels of um, suffering or connected to some experiences in the past or repeated patterns that we keep falling back into that, com that also keeps us in this state of resistance. One of my biggest insights in my life uh, was on a retreat with um, Siador Utejaniya and at some point, and I, uh, this is and I'm a bit embarrassed to say I'd been meditating for at least 15 years, but all of a sudden I realized that mostly what I was doing was resisting. Whatever experience was coming up in life, I was kind of, I had this negative push against it. Whether it was pleasant or unpleasant, I was, it was just a state of my mind. And so the other one was expectations. I realized that my, almost my whole life, I was living in the future. I was living in, what do I want? What am I looking for? I, my mind was always out there somewhere, not back here in the, in the true present. And then because in the present, I wasn't getting what I was expecting, I was disappointed, and so I was resisting. And I'll use a word here that 
I've come to understand very deeply in myself, and this is perfectionism. Unfortunately, it's uh, an experience that many, many people have. It's, there's nothing wrong with it, there's nothing wrong with you, but many people have this perfectionist program running in their mind where they always want to have the perfect experience. And, if, and in their mind, it should be perfect. And if it's not perfect, they're disappointed. And then they feel that resistance. They feel like, ah, it's not good enough. I, I don't like it. I don't want it. There's aversion. And so, because the mind is, let's say, quite greedy, and there are a lot of expectations, so with the perfectionism comes a lot of expectation. When you're expecting, a lot of, when you're expecting perfection, you're going to be disappointed. When you're disappointed, you're going to be in a state of resistance. So I had both of these very classic perfectionist. Living in expectation, living in the future, always looking for what's next, and then being disappointed with what's coming because it wasn't perfect. This is also the Buddha's description of dukkha. It's called, in English, we don't have a word for dukkha, but we can call it unsatisfactoriness. It's just a word that we made up. <laughs> unsatisfactoriness. Now, it doesn't mean dissatisfied. Dissatisfied means I've tried it and I didn't like it. I was dissatisfied. I was expecting something else. Unsatisfactoriness. Ness means the feeling of. Unsatisfactory means I have not yet been satisfied. And so this drives you in your life to always be satisfied. And therefore, you cannot be calm. You cannot be content. You cannot be in upeka because you're always searching for dukkha. Uh, sorry, sukha. <laughs> Some of us are searching for dukkha. <laughs> we don't know, but we are. But even the search, constant search for du uh, sukha, actually manifests as dukkha. Because you're always looking for sukha, you're not satisfied, so you feel the dukkha. It's not what we want, but that's what we get. And this is why the Buddha, in his profound wisdom, realized, basically, it doesn't matter what side of the fence you are on, what kind of personality you are, you are constantly putting yourself into dukkha. It's very rare that we're ever in upeka. Even upeka is not, we, we often might think it's neutral, just a neutral mind. But... Actually, it's not the description of upeka. Upeka is neither dukkha nor sukha, neither pleasant nor unpleasant. Neutral is usually when we feel neutral, it's kind of like, oh, I don't care, oh, you know, whatever. It's indifferent or something. And usually when we look at neutral, we don't like it. Why don't we like neutral? because it's not sukha. The mind is almost always on the grasping, craving for something pleasant. And the Buddha said this is basically, it's, let's say, one of the main reasons why we are suffering. Because we are constantly in a state of desire, looking for something, grasping at something. The Buddha's description of dukkha is not getting what you want, getting what you don't want, and losing the good things that you've had. When I first heard that, I thought, yep, that's my daily life. That's what I'm experiencing every day. Not getting what you want, getting what you don't want, and losing the good things that you've had. That means the nice experiences 
slip between your fingers. Doesn't matter what it is, you hear beautiful music, it comes to an end. Um, you know, you get some romantic experience, it comes to an end. You get, you get a, your favorite ice cream, it comes to an end. I like to give you this little example. Think about your most favorite food. What's the food that you love the most of and you think, oh, I can eat it all day long? Think about that. What's your most favorite food? And now, I give you some. I give you a plate or a bowl or a cup or a whatever of that. And you say, oh, lovely, beautiful, thank you, it's my favorite, and you eat it. And then I say, here's another one. Oh, you say, oh, okay, that's nice. I have another one, okay, can eat two. And here's another one. And you kind of go, hmm, no, you have to eat it. It's your favorite, remember? This is what you love. And you go, oh, okay. <laughs> and you eat that one, and then it's, here's another one. Remember, it's your favorite. You love it. I can eat it all day, remember? <laughs> and then you have another one, and another one, and they, it just keeps coming. This is, it starts off like heaven. And it quickly descends into hell. If you are forced to eat that food continuously, at some point, you're going to vomit, you're going to black out, or you probably have to go to hospital or something. And you will probably never eat that food again for the rest of your life. It's interesting. Something that starts off in heaven can actually end up in hell. Something pleasant can cause great suffering. And especially if you're attached to it, and if you can't get it, especially if you're addicted to it, then you're also suffering. Addicts are always suffering. All of us have some addictive nature. We're all addicted to something, some, some food, some physical feelings, some mental states, some fantasies, so many things that we're addicted to. Activities, you know, even gambling and even sports and some people are even addicted to their work. I, I don't know how that happens, but you know, <laughs> certainly not my experience. Um, <clears throat> so we all have this kind of addictive nature where we get something pleasant and we want it again and again. But again, if you have it too much, then it becomes unpleasant. Or if you can't get it, it's also unpleasant. So, when you look at the world, everybody's chasing what they want. It's also why I asked you this morning, what do you want? What are you looking for? What did you come here for today? I know you didn't come here for money or to become rich or famous or meet the partner of your life or, you know, something like that. So you came here for more high reasons, more clear reasons, more uh, wholesome reasons. But when you step back out into the world, you'll see that people are really just chasing, they're chasing pleasant experiences. But all those pleasant experiences are temporary. They're going to come and they'll go. Just like sand gets washed away by the flood or whatever, it's really temporary. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't have it and that we can't experience it. Go ahead, eat your favorite food. Doesn't matter, eat it every day. But just have a little bit of it and remind yourself, if I attach to this, it's going to become a problem. And even when you're eating it, you say, this is impermanent. This is an impermanent process. It's coming and going as I'm experiencing it. Then the mind is more clear. That's the wisdom that stops you from suffering when even before dukkha arises, you can, let's say, avoid it by being wise and taking wise steps. I'm surprised you're all not so sleepy. You're quite... Ah, oh, Mike. Can I blow up? Mm. So what is the best way or the right way to curb addiction? Curb addiction, yeah. To see 
the suffering that it brings. To see how when we have that attachment and the craving for it, that we we are feeling the suffering. The the when it actually is the three descriptions of the the dukkha that I just said. Getting what not getting what you want. So when you don't get what you're addicted to, you're suffering. Mm. Getting it when you don't want it. So even for an addict, if they've already got what they've got, got what they want. They don't want it once they're satisfied or they've had enough and then not having it or losing it and then having to get it again. So when you understand that all of that is suffering, then eventually you will wake up and realize this doesn't serve me. And even to ask yourself, does this serve me? Does this really make me happy? Is this what my life is for to fulfill this craving in myself and hopefully also you'll start to wake up and realize this is not the purpose of my life just to get what I want yeah okay any other experiences from walking up and down the stairs or mindfulness at lunchtime anything to share ah oh, brother Bobby uh, Brother Jeff, yeah. just now during the uh, slow motion hand movement, yeah, good. When I was be turning the, the my my hand, yes. it seems to find, come in jerks, not, right. not a continuous movement. It's very interesting. Can't Anybody control. else have that experience? Ah, a lot of people. Yeah, so um, it's very interesting, and that's also why I do it. I, as I said, it's not just a, a hand movement exercise. It's a mind training exercise. Can you stay with something in the present moment without thinking and really be fully present? And I think many of you were. However, what we do find is that sometimes the movement is more like click, 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 or <coughs> I find it especially when I bend the finger very, very slowly, I realize I can't do it smoothly. It doesn't just flow into a bend. It's like, it's like sec sections or segments or increments. And then the same when, uh, when I straighten it back out also, I feel it's like click, 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 click like an old creaky door on a farm or something that you know hasn't been opened it's like <coughs> like that so uh, there's no massive insight or you know it doesn't necessarily lead to Nibbana to have this experience but it does help you to realize that uh, again things are not as they seem so if I do that now it's just flowing, normal, whatever. But when I slow it down and I try to do it extremely slowly, I realize that it's almost like, almost like, um, uh, like a film where, it, remember, I don't know how films are made these days, it's all digital, but remember the old film strips? And it was one frame, one frame, one frame. Each frame almost looks the same as the frame next to it, but in one seventeenth, I think, of a second, because there's like 17 frames per second or 24 or something, then it just fractionally changes from frame to frame. So it's a little bit the same when we look at our life. We can almost see that it's like, like a vibration, like arising and passing away very um, momentarily. And even in the Buddha's teachings, they say that even consciousness itself is actually arising and passing away. That it's not a, a pure, f it, it is a flow and it's flowing or arising and passing so fast that we can't see it. But it is still actually uh, arising and passing away. Like a, a river that's, that's flowing, it's actually made up of uncountable 
single actual particles and droplets of, of water and, and H2O and other such stuff. But what we see is one, one river, one flow. So when we look at our mind, we just may, might be aware, oh yes, it's just the mind is there or consciousness. But it actually breaks down into um, experiences, momentary experiences. And so when we move very slowly, we're also starting to break things down into their very precise experiences. So thanks for sharing, Bobby. Anybody else? Anything else about that little hand movement? Brother Jeff, mm. uh, this morning I mentioned that I was uh, agitated. Yes. Yeah, because uh, when the first session when I sat, uh, it started off well, like you say, beautiful breath, long, silky, smooth breath. Yeah. Then it developed into uh, my my knees, my ankles all starts to cramp. Yeah. Usually I don't have that problem. What I have is back ache. That's why I'm sitting on the stool. Same for the second session with the hand. Yeah. Uh, what I had was chest pain, mm. which I've never had. Okay. Um, so I watched the pain because, like I say, anything can happen. <laughs> so it happened today. So okay. I watched the pain. Then Good. my mind starts uh, feeling agitated, and right. later it starts feeling fear. Yes. There was fear coming in. Right. And my the other question is, even now though uh, we are not in any meditating session and not having it, uh, the minute I just focus on my breath or anything, I can feel like I'm in a meditative. Uh, okay. I can feel the long breath and everything. So right. uh, is it because I'm very sensitive or <laughs> definitely I try to cut off? Definitely, yes, you are sensitive. Um, you've practiced before, been practicing for some time. Huh? I do it most evenings. Right, uh, quiet but you've been practicing for many years? No, no? since COVID. Since since co before that, it was like a weekly group session. Yep. But since COVID, it has been a daily session. Okay, uh, all right, yeah. Have you be ever been on retreat? Just yes. take, take the mic, please. Yes, I have been on retreat and I go for yoga in the morning. So usually, sometimes I apply my this meditation in the yoga as well. So that's why sometimes I can feel the sensation, like yep. the, the, the fingers start bloating up, you know, there's heat coming from here and there. Mm. Mm. Um, how long were your retreats? Uh, short retreats, maybe one to three days or one day, short, okay. not, not long retreats, yeah. or zooming from home. I would, um, if you can, I would definitely go to find a very good teacher, someone like Bhante Agachita at Sasanaraka Buddhist Sanctuary and actually do a longer retreat. And because you, you're getting some little bit deeper experiences and you're also, but you're also getting some anxiety. And other friends also might find this, especially sometimes you go deeper into a meditation or you find yourself very concentrated very quickly and sometimes it's a bit shocking. It's a bit like, whoa, where did I go? What happened? Because actually the experience I showed you this morning was the, actually the dissolution of the self. And when the self disappears, you can actually have a little, like the self kind of, when it comes back, it's like, whoa, what happened? You know, I shouldn't do that. Or when we have painful sensations in the body or especially chest area, we can also get um, a little bit of a panic attack because especially if the heart starts beating faster, sometimes the pain gets a little bit stronger and then the heart beats faster and the pain stronger. So sometimes when you have those experiences, it's better just to move and just release yourself from the meditation and just stretch, breathe, go for a walk, just do something else because sometimes when we are very sensitive, or if we have good samadhi, good concentration, sometimes the samadhi will focus on something negative and blow it out of proportion, and it can make you very afraid. But if you have wisdom, then you will be able to realize this is just the mind creating this. I don't need to panic. I don't need to be worried. All of this will pass. So 
Any pain that comes up in your body, you tell yourself this will pass, it's just a natural sensation, or watch how the mind is reacting. If it's panic or fear or worry, even those can be labeled. You can say panicking, panicking, worrying, worrying, fear, fear. You can try to come back to your breath, but it's better to be aware of those mental states. But if it starts to get out of control, I would um, just release, step out of the meditation and just do something normal and ordinary, ordinary. But that's why you should go on a retreat. In fact, I recommend it to all of you so that you're under the guidance of a teacher and that the teacher can, whenever you have anything strange or weird or difficult or problem come up, you go straight to the teacher and you say, I felt this, I experienced this, and they'll guide you through it. That's, that's the best part about being on a retreat, is that you're with the teacher. So being on Zoom is okay, but you only Zoom half an hour, one hour, two hours, and then you're, you're on your own again. You may not get a chance to ask questions and have one-on-one -on -one with the teacher. So that's also why it's important to share our experiences here like this, because if one person's experiencing it, then quite often the other people are also experiencing it. Some of you may have come here today thinking, oh, I'm going to do vipassana the whole day, I'm going to sit in silence, I'm going to meditate. That's really great, um, and I'm sorry that it's not turning out that way for you, but for me, vipassana is going with the flow, being in the moment. Whatever's happening, that's what I'm doing. That's where my lesson is. If some guy's sitting up the front talking a lot, that's my, that's my meditation. That's my awareness. That's what, that is my karma, in fact. Karma here means the conditions of my life that have brought me to this present moment. So no matter what's happening, no matter where you are, what is happening now is your reality. And that is your karma. Whether you've just won you know, a million dollars in the lottery, or whether you've just smashed your car, or, you know, you've lost your phone, or whatever it is, that is your teacher. That is your experience. That is what you're supposed to be having right now. And to be able to surrender to that, surrender to the present moment and say, I'm present. What, what can I learn from this? This is my teaching. So when you have an experience, whether it's pleasant or unpleasant, whether it's physical or mental, we allow ourselves to feel that, to experience it. And almost that last part of my three-part reminder, um, let me learn, let me watch and learn from whatever arises. So that's all we're doing. We're surrendering to the moment and saying, okay, I've got this pain, how can I learn from this pain? What's, what's this pain offering me? Not, why is this pain coming up, I shouldn't have this pain, try and get rid of the pain, stop the pain, or try to solve it by thinking. It's surrender. Allow yourself to experience it. This is your karma. This is your moment. Now is the only moment that we live in. Long answer. <laughs> but see if you can make some time in your life to go for a retreat with a very good teacher someone that you've heard has a very good uh, reputation and someone that you know can guide you and you'll be able to sort out all these little things that you experience in meditation thank you very much you're welcome yep You. Uh, I came here with an open mind <laughs> because actually I don't know meditation. I'm just a beginner. Great. So I have got friends. I have friends who meditate a lot, and they they, they describe the experiences that you know, like you feel like this, like that. Then when I was trying to do just now, I see I don't feel anything. So that means to say I don't have samadhi. I don't have wisdom. So I'm just wondering, am I normal? Because like when I try to meditate. My mind is a monkey mind, go here, go there, and I feel sleepy. 
but I don't feel like uh, like what you have described. Mm. So I'm not sure whether am I normal or not, or what what should I do? You know, and I cannot picture the 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 feeling that my friends describe. I was thinking is don't is something that how do they feel it? How come I don't feel it? So I I don't know. Maybe I'm not putting the right words, but I feel like I don't I don't think I can achieve meditation. Mm. Yeah. So I just want to know whether is there anything I can do? Yeah. I mean, I've gone with friends for usually beginners retreat, but I never pass that stage because always I don't get through that stage because it doesn't answer my question. What's your question? My question is, when I medit try to meditate, am I supposed to be aware that I'm, I'm trying to meditate? No, it goes in my mind. I'm trying to meditate. I'm trying to meditate. Then. Am I supposed to be not aware of everything, or am I supposed to be aware that I'm trying to meditate? Wow! So I don't know what you supposed to feel. <laughs> what you're supposed to feel when you're meditating? I concur. I have the same issue. Okay, <laughs> great. Because I think I think too much. I keep thinking instead yes. of truly letting go and just be still, be there in the moment. Okay. Yeah. Great. Perfect. So. <laughs> Can you take? Can you feel one in breath? Ah, that I could do it. Ah, then you meditated. <laughs> I always that idea that meditate means it's. Uh, I I don't know how to describe it, but it doesn't fit the description that my friends give. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So. You you. S we say that we're open-minded, and when you said I came here with an open mind, I laughed, and I'm I excuse. Sorry for for doing that, but whenever I hear people say, oh, "I don't have any expectations," I, I, I you know wasn't expecting anything. Actually, we are expecting something. Even we don't know what we're expecting, but we're still expecting something. But when I hear you say you do like ah, I say ah, this clicks with me. You do you know like anything can go. It's meditation. Right. Walking is meditation. Eating nice. is meditation. So it's sort of ah, this is what I want. Not sit down and don't move your legs and that kind of thing. Right. right. Yeah. And, and coming back to the just one additional, just now coming back to the eating, I actually work with a lot of visually handicapped people, and I see people who lost their vision from glaucoma. They have got other things. I always wonder how do they eat, you know? So my experience with not being able to see, not so much of mindfulness, is that I had this experience of dining in the dark. You don't know what you're eating, and then you try to guess what you're eating. But yeah. today we know what we are eating, so it's different. So you yeah. can actually taste the food. The last time when I did the dining in the dark, it was guessing what you're eating, and yes. all the time was wrong. Ah, right. Yeah. And and there's a lot of thinking in that experience. So, unfortunately, when you do dining in the dark, they are not teaching you mindfulness meditation. So today was actually, as you said, a very different experience. You already saw what you're eating, but even for myself, I ate the mandarin and I ate the apple. That's why I put that on the plate. So even then, when I closed my eyes, I didn't know am I going to get apple or mandarin. Only till I feel it, then I can I can know it. And then, but still. There was some expectation. Ah, oh, this is mandarin. I can feel it's mandarin. I know what mandarin tastes like. But until you put it in your mouth, I don't know. I don't know what it's actually going to taste like. And then you eat the mandarin after the apple, or you eat the apple after the mandarin. Is a different taste, different experience. So even though you ate the apple before, but if you eat the apple after the mandarin, it tastes different. Same, same apple. Different experience, so don't be caught up in in thinking that you're supposed to have a specific experience from meditation. Let your friends have their experiences and let them talk about what they want to talk about. You come back to your experience and what is happening in your mind. That is your responsibility. So um, we were. We also did the the hand movement exercise. Now again, people might do that and think, "Oh, I didn't get anything. There there wasn't anything to get. It was only it was an experiment to see 
Can you stay with a present moment experience? So now when you go home and mop your kitchen floor, can you stay in the present while you mop the kitchen floor? Because could you stay in the present while you did this? Oh yes, I can do that. And so can you take some food mindfully and really taste and experience it? Yes. So we're not looking for any amazing experience. What your friends probably got was or were some after doing meditation for some time or when they went on retreat and they went deeper or they had those experiences and then they said, oh, wow, I was on retreat or, you know, I meditated this teacher, that teacher, this, this technique, that technique. I got this experience. And then you think, oh, I'm going to go do meditation. I'll, I'll see if I can have what experience. But it was also interesting that you also said that you didn't really know how to explain what you were looking for. But we're actually looking for something. When you're looking for something, but you don't know what it is, how are you going to find it? So you have to clear your mind and say, I'll just experience what I experience. So that's why I give that three-part reminder I don't know what I'm I don't know what will happen. Anything can happen. Let me watch and learn from whatever happens. And then your experience is your experience. Whether you share it with your friends or not, whether you get some fireworks and light shows or you know whatever it is going on in your mind, then that's up to you. Some people will have that, some people won't. Some people will just be calm and quiet. And that's also up to the individual karma. Some people are just naturally calm, quiet people. Yes, their thoughts are running, but also one thing in this practice is to be able to just see thoughts as thoughts. Doesn't matter what the content of the thought is. It's like all the cars, imagine we go out and we stand on the side of the road down there, the, the busy road, and all the cars are going this way and that way. It's not like you have to stand there and say, um, oh, that's a, that's a Porsche, or oh, that's a, you know, a garbage truck, or that's a you know, motorbike or something. It's just, it's just traffic. It's just, just vehicles, just things going up and down. When you just let it be just traffic, it's just traffic. You don't have to sort it out, you don't have to categorize it, you don't have to name it. It's just traffic. And when the traffic stops, because of the lights or the time or whatever, you can just walk clearly across the road or notice that there's no traffic. So we're not trying to stop the traffic of the mind. So I think both of you said that you're having um, busy mind, monkey mind, or, or whatever. That's perfectly okay, because we're not trying to make the mind the way we want it to be. We're seeing the way the mind already is. And when we start to accept it and allow it to be as it is, then we're not controlling and forcing the mind to be something that it's not. Normally in our life, that's what we do. And it's often why people come to meditate. They want to get rid of their anger, want to get rid of their stress, want to get rid of their, their thoughts or get rid of something, change something, fix something, upload something, enhance something, make something better. We actually don't need to do that. But what we need to do is see how is the mind operating. If you take the car to the mechanic, then the mechanic has to run the car to see what's the problem with the car. Why is the car not working? Even you tell him what's wrong, he still has to do, he has to run the check on it. He has to check it for himself. So all we're doing is we're just checking how's the mind running? How's the body operating? How does the body and mind operate with each other and connected to each other? How does my physical feelings make my mind react? 
How does my mind reactions make my physical body feel? How's the interaction between these two entities, if you like, or two forms of energy? And then we're understanding what is life. How is life unfolding? If you think about, um, let's just think about, what if, what if you won 10 million ringgit? All of a sudden, you got 10 million ringgit. So, how does the mind react to that information? And how does the feeling come with that thought? It's quite exciting, isn't it? It's like, wow, what could I do with all that, all that ringgit? It's just a thought. Now think what would happen if you, if a car, no, a lorry, ran over top of your phone and smashed it into 300 pieces. How would that feel? So, even we're just sitting here now, apparently not doing very much, but when you have those thoughts, the mind reacts, and then there's a feeling attached to that thought. That's what's happening all day long in your life. Somebody tells you something, then the mind reacts. You feel something in your body, the mind reacts. You, um, you see something, the mind reacts. You smell, you taste, you feel, you, you, you do something through the six, the five physical senses and through your mind. Your mind is just basically a little reacting machine. It just reacts to everything that happens. So this is why my teacher or our teacher, Siado Utejaniya, he's saying, watch how your mind reacts. That's all you do. Everywhere you go, you're just checking, how do I feel now? How's the mind reacting now? No matter, what, no matter what's going on, whether things are going well and flowing nicely for you, or whether things are blocked and stuck and, and not going well. How do you feel? How is the mind reacting? And then you realize that all this passes. Everything passes in your life. So, again, I'm still surprised that you're all awake. <laughs> Last week, by default, did you want to ask something? Was there no? No. Um, you got okay. Um, this is my first ever retreat. Woohoo! <laughs> um, I've been doing a lot of um, online uh, ret uh, meditation. Yes. But I, I get what you say, mm. and and many of them. Um, the ones I've been doing have been mostly our Western um, meditation, and yep. they. I I read that they actually in the West they have um, secularized Buddhism. Yes. So that the terms that you all have been using were not used. Yes. So those terms are new to me, yeah. and I'm not a practicing uh, Buddhist. Yep. Uh, but I get what you say that you 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 watch your mind and uh, you're aware of all this, but. Uh, two questions: Will all this um, self, you know, all this reflection, or whatever you call it, eventually help you to make a right decision in whatever it is you have to decide? Mm -hmm. And secondly, uh, you say everything that you do is meditation. So if I'm, for example, immersed in an activity, uh, like say painting, and I lose myself in it for a whole hour. And then I come out of it and, and then I sit down and I'm suddenly aware of my um, surroundings. So with that, you would you consider that immersion in that, in that experience a meditation? It depends. Um, when you say immersed, do, are, you, are you saying that you did not have any thoughts during that whole hour? Have any what? Thoughts. Thoughts. Uh, no, my, my mind would be concentrated on that activity. Hmm. Uh, I, I give the example of painting. Yes. 
okay, um, how do I do it? What paints do I use? Is this the right one? Are they thoughts? I guess so, but there mm. is also a lot of action. Yes, sure, sure. The mind is still active. It may not be thinking about something from the past, something from the future. You're actually, your thoughts are really about about the, the actual activity itself. So a lot of us do this. We get, we get, as you said, immersed in what we do. Sometimes it's work that you're immersed in. Sometimes it's a hobby that you're immersed in. Sometimes it's uh, maybe sports or dancing or music also has that um, very immersive experience. So it's not that we're, um, we're just not having thoughts about other things in other places, but we're thinking and we are engaged in the experience. So the mind is still very much, um, uh, very much present. I would say it's good, but it's always better if you know that you are in the experience. So when we meditate, we know what we are doing. We are fully aware of the process. But sometimes when we do something like a hobby or something that you love, you do get immersed in it and therefore you actually don't really know that you're doing it. That's why you said after one hour or when I'm finished, it's like I come back from that experience. So it's not the same as meditation. This meditation especially means that you know exactly what you're doing from moment to moment. So from when you wake up in the morning until you go to sleep at night, when you lay down in bed at night, you should be able to recall almost everything that you did during the day. Whereas sometimes, most of us don't even, can't even remember most of what we did for the whole day. Driving and doing mundane activities, that's quite normal. But then we also can get lost in work, we can get lost in music, we can get lost in hobbies and other such things as well. So the best thing is to do it, but do it mindfully. And that means to know that you are being present. So you also said something about um, knowing that, am I supposed to be thinking about the fact that I'm meditating now? But it's something like that, but you're not thinking about it. You just know that you are mindful. You know that you're watching your breath. You know that you're feeling a pain. You know that you're hearing a sound. You know that you're seeing somebody walking in the door. So this knowing is what changes everything. So when you do your painting, then do it. try doing it with mindfulness and see what happens. Notice how you select the paints. Notice how your hand moves. Notice how you feel while you're doing it. I think it will change. It will actually change quite a lot. And it will become a meditation. That was the first part. What was the, uh, the second uh, part? Will, what was will meditation help you to uh, make a right decision? 100% it will. But because it's mindfulness, which means I'm really present, I have this decision to make, I know I have to make this decision, I'm not just freaking out thinking, oh, what if this goes wrong? What if that goes wrong? So you're not just in freaking out mind or worrying or stressing or whatever. You know, I have to make this decision, but you're checking. If I make the decision this way, how will I feel? If I make the decision that way, how will I feel? So you're checking your emotions, but also the wisdom that arises in our life through this meditation guides us in all of our decision-making processes as much as possible. So it's much better to make a decision from wisdom than from ignorance or not knowing. So it does help you to stop. And just as I've said a couple of times today, compose your mind. If you have to make a decision, compose your mind. Just stop and then check. How do I feel? Okay, how do I want to make this decision? But we can't, we're not perfect. So we're going to make lousy decisions sometimes. And sometimes it's, it can have a painful result. It can have an uh, unpleasant or disappointing result. We use our mindfulness and our wisdom in that also. And then we check, ah, 
last, when I made that decision, I was feeling like that, I did that, and now I got this result. Okay, next time I need to make this decision, let me be more mindful, and so we grow with our wisdom as we go. So we're mindful of our decision-making processes, but then we're mindful of the results that come. If it's unpleasant, then I know, why, how did I make that decision that I created something unpleasant? Or if it turns out pleasant, how did I make, or why did I make that decision that, that turns out pleasant? So then you know, I can avoid doing m the unpleasant things and uh, start doing more pleasant things. It does help a lot. Thank you. Ooh. Great. Okay. So, again, we've been... Really? It's five to three? <laughs> okay. Time is very much an illusion. So we've actually been sitting for a while. So, again, very... Actually, we'll do a little experiment. It's also a little mindfulness of movement. What we're going to do is, with our eyes closed, we're going to stand up from this position. But there's one trick. So the people sitting on the floor, it will be more complicated for you. The friends sitting up on the chairs, it's a little bit easier to stand up from, from that position. But for some of us with our legs closed and our eyes crossed, <laughs> Um, it's a little more difficult. What I'm suggesting is that you only move one movement at a time. So normally if I'm going to stand up, I'll do everything at once. So what I'm suggesting is you can only move one movement first. Like you move one hand. When that's finished, then you can move another one. And then when that's finished, you move the next one. And when that's finished, you move the next one. And slowly, part by part, step by step, we will build our body into an upright position. So even sitting on a chair, um, maybe I'll make it more difficult for you. Maybe you have to cl cross your arms <laughs> sitting, not for you guys on the floor, you are already got to sort your legs out, but up there on your chair. Now, with your, by the way, do you cross your arms this way or do you cross your arms that way? Which is the, is the right hand on top or the left hand on top? Just checking. Mindfulness, which way, does, which way do you automatically fold your arms? We all do it. And we, if, I, if I said fold your arms, bang, you just do it without thinking. But that's also a little decision-making process and it's the habit of the, of the mind, not the habit of a body. The body doesn't have habits. It's all your mental states. So what... Now, when you're in this position, or with the legs as is, how, what is the first movement that I'm going to make? And once I've made that first movement, and it comes to an end, and I do it somewhat slowly, what's the next movement? And then, what will be the next movement? Okay, so slowly, mindfully, living in the present, being with the body and mind, watching the decision-making processes, which is, I believe is very important. Even, you know, before you move, there is an intention to move. If I want to have a drink now, there's an intention in my mind, I intend to drink even before I reach and take the drink bottle. Your mind has already decided what's going to happen before it happens. This is decision-making processes. And if you can catch that intention and even check it, question it, 
What is my intention here? Why am I doing this? What is the reason behind this? Not so much these little mundane movements, but more things about your life and your relationship. When you're about to say something to someone, why am I saying this? Am I just saying it because I want to look clever or I want to put them down or I want to prove my point or I want to prove them wrong or I want to sell them something or I want to get something from them? Why am I even talking to this person? And why am I saying what I am saying? This is very strong karma actually. Our friend sitting right here in front of me, reminding me the whole time today, his t-shirt says, Sama Wacha, which means right speech. And if you're going to sit in this position up here, you have to be very, very careful of every word that you say, because people are listening, especially in this context. You have to be very, very mindful of all the words that you use. So, but in our daily life, Every single person is responsible for every single word that they say. And if you say something nasty, you say something harmful, you say something that's untrue, that comes back to you. That's your karma. And only you are responsible for that. Nobody else. So being mindful, your intention before you speak is important. Just to finish this little... Um, section, I can say. As human beings, we have three actions. Karma literally means action. It means cause. It means to do something. We have three as humans. We act, we speak, and we think. Every day in your life, you do these three things. In one way, it's to describe a human being. That's what we do. We act, we speak, and we think. Speech, action, thought. Every day. Maybe some days you don't speak. That's possible. But what's happening in your mind? Have, ever you, have you, any, any of you done a silent retreat? You do a silent retreat, and yes, you're not speaking verbally, but in your mind... You're having thousands of conversations. That's still technically, karmically, it's still speaking, or at least it is thinking. So there are these three karmas, three modes of karma, speech, action, and thought. Every time you speak, you act, and you think, you're putting something out. You're putting an energy out. Whatever you put out, that energy will come back. This is the perpetuation of our life force. This is where Nibbana, enlightenment, it actually, that burns out. You don't, you're no longer putting out karma in the sense of positive or negative karma. Your karma is not my shirt today, but upeka or neutralized. And so there is this, um, by not putting out any bad karma or good karma, then there's this neutralization or, um, I don't want to go too deeply into it, but um, the Buddha said it's the, it's the end of suffering, the cessation of suffering is an explanation of enlightenment. So where were we? Back to, the, um, back to the, this little practice that we're going to do together. So this is all just because I wanted you to stand up for a few minutes, but it's turned into a full, um, full experience. Yeah. So for the friends sitting at the back, at the, in the chairs, you can fold your arms. For friends sitting cross-legged on the floor or however you're sitting on the floor. We're going to attempt to move into this standing position. We're going to do it one movement at a time, not two movements at a time, only one at a time. 
So first, I want you to just come into stillness. Gently close your eyes. Feel where your body's connected with the earth, with the floor. If you're sitting on the chair, you can feel your feet on the floor. You feel your bottom on the chair. If you need to cough, just cough it out. Just enjoy coughing. It's all good. Feel the weight of the body, the pressure of the body. By the way, this is some form of contact with the earth is always present. It's another meditation object that you can experience, whether you're standing or walking or laying down or sitting. You are somehow connected to the earth. Feel your hands touching whatever they're touching. Feel your back straight. Roll your shoulders up and back and down. Relax your shoulders, relax your face. As you breathe in, Relax your whole body. As you breathe out, relax your whole body. Start to feel the breath, the coolness of the in-breath, the warmth of the out-breath. Can you simply feel that coolness arise and pass away, but without any thought? Can you feel the warmth as it comes and goes, without thinking, without imagining, just experiencing? Please notice how the mind calms down, especially if you can feel, feel that coolness arise and pass away, and the warmth arise and pass away, without any commentator, without any opinion, without any past or future. Just sensation, just awareness. And remember, we're going to stand up. So now, just take a few moments in your mind to make a plan. Which, what will I move first? What is my first movement? And when that movement finishes, what will be my second movement? And when I finish that, what will be third and fourth and fifth, sixth? How am I going to stand up? And before you make your first movement, or even any movement, I'd like, to s I'd like you to see your intention in your mind. 
before you move your hand, your arm, your foot, watch how the mind signals the body. It sends an impulse from the mind to that part of the body to make the movement happen. This is also karma. Very basic, very physical, but also necessary. When you are ready, and you can do this as slow as you like, and keep your eyes closed, please don't watch anyone. I'm doing this with you, I'm not watching. Being aware of your intention first, begin your first movement. And then follow with the second. This could take 10 or 15 minutes to stand up. That's what I mean by slow. Very slowly. See if you feel impatient. See if you feel any resistance or laziness. If I can hear you moving, you're probably moving too fast. <laughs> Slow down. If by any chance you're already standing, please stand with your eyes closed. Observe your breath, observe the contact with the floor. And some of you have only made your first move, I assume. Take your time. Finish one movement and start the next. Once you're standing, stand still, relax, roll your shoulders up and back and down, feet gently apart.
Just make sure your feet are on the ground, on the floor, not on the cushion. Notice how your feet are warming the floor already. If you're still standing, still in the process, take your time. Take as long as you like. If you're already standing, can you take one in-breath without thinking? An out-breath without thinking? What else is happening in the body? Open your awareness to any mental or physical phenomenon, process, that's predominant now. Is there some pain? Is the body moving? or swaying. What's predominant? Now remember that question. Which foot do you start walking on? If you were to take a step and start walking now, which foot would you start with? So what we're going to do, again, very, very slowly, really super slowly, like we did with our hand and finger, if you, and we're going to use the other foot, not the foot that you would normally use, just to make you a little bit more mindful. If you were to start walking now, what will be the first thing that you will do to prepare to take one step. If you feel afraid to do this with your eyes closed, it's okay. If you need to check if there's something in front of you on the floor or something, feel free to check quickly. We're only taking one step, it's okay, and it only, can be, only needs to be half a step. We're not walking anywhere. But I want you to feel, firstly, the intention and the decision-making process that sends the signal from your mind to your foot. Secondly, when you start to do it very slowly, please observe what your body must do to even take one very short very slow step. And when you are ready, you can take very slow, very short, like a little half a step. In your own time, continue. Take one small step.
and just pause feel your feet on the earth notice the difference in temperature between the two feet and when you're ready we're just going to bring the rear foot to join the front foot try to do it even more slowly than you did the first time feel the heel lifting what's happening in the body And simply stand, feet together, body relaxed. What else is happening? Open up to freestyle vipassana. Even check your mind. Are you relaxed? Are you nervous? Is there anything worrying? Are you curious? How are you feeling? Can you just feel that feeling? Don't fix it, change it, stop it. Just feel. And now we're going to reverse that process. Or maybe we do it the other foot. You do it any way you like. This time we can take the first step and we can step back a little half step in reverse. Watch the process. What do you have to do to take half a step back in your own time? begin the process and in your own time take that second step back to feet together Check yourself. Am I aware? Am I mindful? Am I relaxed? What's happening now? How do I feel? If you get confused or lost, it's okay. Just come back to feel your breath. Breathe in, relax. And breathe out, relax. And now, very slowly, but with eyes open, if you want a challenge and you feel you're physically capable and everything's all right, then you can very slowly take your seat back down again. But if you like and you prefer, 
just have a look, check, make sure you're sitting down comfortably, safely, and very, very slowly we go back down into sitting position. Take your time, enjoy the journey. This too is meditation. Mindfulness of movement. Living in the present. Check yourself. Is your mind in the past or the future? Check. How do you feel? Is there any fear? Any worry? And continue the flow of mindfulness into sitting with mindfulness. Continue with freestyle, just awareness of whatever is happening naturally. Or come back to your breath. Start with the breath. Try to sit in stillness for the next few minutes without movement. I invite you to simply feel the stillness of the body. The absence of movement. The body is never perfectly still, the breath is breathing, the pulse is beating. But in the absence of intentional movement, there is stillness. Can you clear the screen of your mind? Let go of all mental pictures. Can you see your mind as blank or black? Empty or space? And listen in your mind 
for any words or stories or thoughts and just hear the silence in your mind stillness in the body space in the mind and silence simplicity purity stillness space silence If a thought arises, simply notice it. If any of your senses becomes predominant, notice it. Gently come back to stillness, space, silence. Simplicity, right now your life is very simple, in this moment, this body, this mind, here and now. With the absence of the past and the future, Very simple. If there is no thought, simply feeling, sensing, there is no dukkha, there is no sukha. Just processes. even no self cause and effect simplicity let a thought come, let a thought go let a sound come and go. Let a breath come and go. Let a feeling, a sensation come and go. Let an emotion come and go.
try to remain still don't move if you feel a pain allow it to be present if it's itchy or discomfort just feel it it is changing it will pass watch how the mind reacts to it the aversion the resistance the impatience the dukkha And the breath is breathing by itself. The heart, too, is beating continuously. The food we ate at lunch is digesting. All the systems of your body are working perfectly your immune system your nervous system all the systems working in harmony all your senses are working now Your mind is working now. Some thoughts, some awareness, some emotions arising and passing away due to conditions. Everything is as it is. The external world, the whole world, it is as it is. This body and mind also is as it is. I am as I am. And all is well. The external world, it is as it is. I am as I am. And all is well. And all is well. When you are ready, if you wish, you may start to move, open your eyes if you wish, and sit comfortably, relax, take your time. If you're happy as you are, stay there. 
go with the flow. So remember the time was almost three o'clock when we started that little exercise. We did we did quite a few things actually. St standing up with mindfulness, standing with mindfulness, taking two little steps forward with mindfulness, two little steps back, and sitting down with mindfulness and flowing that into the sitting meditation. <coughs> Does anyone have any comment? about that experience, the standing up, the sitting down, the stepping, the standing. Anything to share? Yeah? When I found myself started to, my mind started to wander, I anchor my mind to uh, my breathing, in and out breathing, in order to feel the movement. Okay. And also, at the at the end of the mindfulness, I s started to feel uh, sleepy, and I started to doze off, and also my mind started to wander again. So I wasn't sure whether my mind was wandering or I was dreaming because I was sleepy and I tried to anchor my mind to the breathing again. So is that the correct way of practicing mindfulness? Mm -hmm. Right. So one thing is that the sleepiness doesn't come before the wandering mind. It's the wandering mind that causes the sleepiness. So the mind already started to wander and that's why it starts to become sleepy. If you're really with your meditation object or whatever it is that's happening, if you're really present, then the mind won't go into sleepiness. So the mind already started to wander or drift and then it will fall into sleepiness. So try to catch the wandering mind first and then there probably won't be any sleepiness. Instead of... Um, Ignoring or fighting with the sleepiness, try to observe what is sleepiness. Have you ever directly looked at sleepiness? In, our, in my first teacher's teaching, he said even label sleepy, sleepy, sleepy. And actually look at the sleepiness. Try to find it. What is sleepiness? Why is it like this thief that comes and just steals your meditation or steals your mindfulness away. Why does the mind work like that? Why does sleepiness arise? Yes, we can say, oh, I didn't sleep enough or I, you know, I didn't do this or I did that or blah, blah, blah. Many excuses or reasons for it. But what is sleepiness? 
what causes it to arise, why does it exist, and why does sleepiness disappear? So, for example, you might check now, am I sleepy? And you realize, no, there's no sleepiness in the present, especially after you've spoken, I think your mind is more fresh. So, it's not about stop sleepiness and go back to the meditation. Sleepiness becomes your meditation object in vipassana. Whatever arises predominantly in the present moment, that's your object of meditation. If you feel pain in your body, that's your object of meditation. If the dog's barking outside the door, that's your object of meditation. If you're thinking, oh, why doesn't the dog shut up and, you know, that's my neighbor's stupid dog and, you know, blah, blah, blah. What's happening now? It's not about the dog. It's about how I'm reacting to the dog. Am I angry? Am I frustrated? Am I disappointed? How is the mind reacting here? This is the important part, not what's happening out there. So whatever is coming to you in your body and mind in the present moment, that's your object of meditation. In this way, we navigate life. Whatever arises, wherever you go, whatever you do, that is your meditation. This is very different. It's not about sitting meditation. Sitting is one way of training your mind. But the Buddha taught walking meditation, lying down meditation, mm, standing meditation. He also taught eating mindfully, going somewhere mindfully, doing daily activities mindfully. That's one reason why I greatly respect my first teacher. He was always telling us, you must be mindful of your daily activities. If you're not mindful of your daily activities, then the meditation, he used to say, is hopeless. I don't know if it's the right word, but there's a strong message there. And that is, you must be mindful of everything else you do, not just the sitting meditation or the formal sitting, standing, walking meditation. And I love this because then I can bring the essence of the meditation into everything I do as much as possible. And then, because there's, no, there's nothing that says, oh, if you're doing sitting meditation, then you'll be enlightened from sitting meditation. There are many examples where people have become enlightened when they were doing many other different things. Or perhaps not so much enlightened, but getting insights. You could be just buying something off the shelf in the supermarket and have some insight. You could be sitting in a forest just, I don't know, watching the birds or something and get some insight. Or you could be even downtown in the city and watching all these people doing all this stuff and just getting some insight. There's no restriction about when and where and how you will understand something about life. But the more you are mindful in as many different situations, you increase the possibility for insight to arise. Learn from your sleepiness. It's a good teacher. Pain also is a good teacher. Most people will move once pain arises. My, again, my first teacher said, don't move. Stay where you are. Sit with the pain. Sit with the discomfort. Sit with the, the itchiness or, you know, the fly that's trying to crawl in your ear or the mosquito that's biting your arm or whatever. Stay with it. Feel it. Experience it. But check your mind. How am I reacting to this? It's how your mind reacts that's more important. We can try and avoid all these things in life if we want. Actually, you won't be able to avoid pain. Even you lay in bed, you're going to get pain. You lay there long enough, you're going to get pain. You can't avoid pain. It's going to keep coming. Better to understand pain. Find the truth of pain. Find how your mind reacts to pain. 
Why does your mind keep resisting and rejecting pain? It's a normal part of life. Actually, if you look into painful sensations, they are made up of vibration, heat, pressure, movement, hardness. What all these are are just different characteristics of the four elements. Earth, wind, fire and water. The Buddha said all physical things are made up of four elements. Your body is made up of four elements. The food you eat are made of four elements. It's all four elements. All these four elements are all forms of energy. When you feel pain, the vibration is the wind element, movement. Movement is the wind element. Pressure or hardness is the earth element. Fire, uh, sorry, heat or cold sometimes is the um, fire element. And sometimes there's a fluidity or a, a, a conjoining or something that's holding all that pain seemingly together. That's the water element, that which combines and joins everything together. I see pain like a fist, and if I say, oh, that's a vibration, that's, a, um, that's hardness, that's temperature, that's movement, that's uh, pressure, what have I done? I've just basically released the pain. You see its different characteristics, and somehow it falls apart. Meanwhile, while you do that, you don't see it as pain anymore. You see it as a vibration, as a movement, as pressure, as heat. And then the mind calms down. When the mind calms down, it's, the mind's not tense. Then the pain's not tense. Then the body relaxes. Then the pain relaxes. Many yogis experience that the pain just disappears. We're not trying to make the pain disappear but it dis disappears because the causes that you made in your mind to create the pain actually dissolve. When they dissolve, the pain dissolves. This is very interesting and also very powerful. When people understand this, you can actually dissolve even intense and chronic pain. They've experimented using vipassana on chronic pain uh, patients in hospitals and they can override the pain in their mind by using vipassana. It's, it's very powerful. And the other thing is even if you don't remove the physical cause for the pain, the, the physical cause is still there, it's up to your mind what you do with that pain. And I experienced this for myself I used to get a very strong pain up my right, um, right upper leg from my butt right down to my knee. It was like somebody was putting a red hot sword through the bone of my leg. And I could, but I, the thing is I could sit there for a very long time and feel that maybe I have a high pain threshold. Some people do. But my mind was kind of screaming, going like, oh, pain. And then at one point, I realized, wait, I just survived that pain. The pain's still there. I'm still alive. I didn't die. And then I thought, huh? Theoretically, I could sit with this pain for the rest of my life. And when that happened, my mind went completely silent. The pain was still there, the physical pain was there, the mind was in complete peace, completely peaceful. And it was a very strange experience. And then I realized, and of course the mind then comes out of that and then all the old, and then it starts going, oh my leg, I'm painting. But for some time, the mind was completely pain free and peaceful. No dukkha whatsoever. No worry, no fear, nothing. Not trying to get rid of it, change it, fix it, nothing. But the pain was still there. So then I understand how this is possible and you can actually train your mind into that state of being. 
if you want to. But the point is not to get rid of the pain, the point is to understand how the body and mind work and how pain arises and passes away. It's also impermanent. It's also, the problem is we take it personally, but when you see it as four elements and its different characteristics, it's their processes, their energies, they are moving, they are changing. Then we don't take it personally. When you don't take it personally, you're also becoming free from the pain. You can do the same with mental states. Thoughts, you just see them as traffic, see them as clouds in the sky, see them as, as waves on the beach that come and go. But as soon as you are involved in a thought and take it personally, then you're stuck with it. You've got, you've got the dukkha that's arising with that. But if it, even as a meditator, if you're fighting with your thoughts and trying to stop them, you're just creating more dukkha in yourself. You're not understanding the technique. And the technique is to just see thoughts are thoughts. Hot is hot. Cold is cold. Pain is pain. Everything is as it is. I am as I am and all is well. That's how I finished that, that last meditation. Everything in the world has its own nature independent of how I want it to be or how I view it to be. Everything in the world has its own nature. It is as it is. A funny little English sentence. It is as it is. Five words, all with two letters. It is as it is. It's a legitimate English sentence. It is as it is. And it's the truth. Whatever it is, it is as it is. Even you change it, it is as it is. It's in its changed form. It is as it is. Everything in the world is as it is. This body is as it is now. The mind is as it is now. I am as I am. I am as I am. And all is well. I could say, all is not well, but no need to say, it's not well, because everything is, is well. It is as it is, so this is my closing uh, reminder motto that I'll share with you. It is as it is, I am as I am, and all is well. It is as it is. I am as I am, and all is well. It's very simple, but a good reminder. You also have the main reminder that I gave you this morning. Mm, I don't know what will happen. Anything can happen. Let me watch and observe, let me watch and learn from whatever happens. <clears throat> So, uh, surprisingly, our six hours is up. Congratulations, you've done very well. It goes so fast, doesn't it? It's really, really amazing that the time can go so quickly. Um, I would like to let you know that I have, there's a website, uh, freestylevipassana.com. I think I already mentioned it earlier freestylevipassana.com there's uh, the book is on there the uh, forgiveness for everyone so you can download that for free also on the website there are many um, many videos that uh, we recorded from my zoom sessions that I did back in uh, COVID so those are all free for you to watch I think they're on the website, but they're connected to YouTube, so it will probably take you to YouTube. I also have Freestyle Vipassana YouTube channel, so you can go there if you'd like to uh, watch some of the, the videos there. Um, uh, last week's session was videoed, and this week also is. 
um, our amazing friends here at BGF. They do their little magic with the, with the videos and make them very beautiful. And um, they are on the BGF site. If there's anything in the content today that you feel that you would like to reconnect with or listen to again, so even the meditations that I've done today and I did last week uh, are also on, um, on uh, video and it's on the BGF uh, YouTube channel. Yeah. So uh, I do have an Instagram page also called Freestyle Vipassana and if you want to connect with me personally, you can also message me through that Instagram, Instagram page as well. Besides that, I also have Facebook. <coughs> it's not called Freestyle Vipassana. Uh, there is a Freestyle Vipassana with Jeff Oliver Facebook page. And I do post there sometimes. So you can find that. Um, and I'm also on Facebook and WhatsApp and everything else too, if you want to contact me. Arahan Samma Sambuddho Bhagava Bhutam Bhagavantam Abhivatemi So akato bhagavata dhammo dhamma namasami Supati pano bhagavato sa Sangha Namami Sadhu 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 